Many of Jesus' disciples who were listening said, this saying is hard, who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that the disciples were murmuring, he said to them, does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. But Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would not believe and the very one who would betray him. And so he said, for this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer accompanied him. Jesus then said to the 12, do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Today's Gospel is about people who abandon their faith. Let's take a look at the question, what is faith? Many people say that faith is a blind leap in the dark. Personally, I think a blind leap in the dark is absurd and I would never undertake it. Faith instead is what happens here every Saturday afternoon at two o'clock when two people come to get married. They don't know that it will work. But based on the, the knowledge that they have of their relationship, their attraction to one another, their compatibility, their ability to enrich and make one another better, they're ready to take the risk. It's a calculated risk. I don't know that God exists, but based on the evidence that I can examine, I would much rather take the risk that he does exist than he doesn't. And if he does exist, then immediately there emerges the nagging question, why do I have to go to Mass? Because if he exists, I owe him big time. He gave me the gift of life when in fact I did absolutely nothing to deserve it. And furthermore, he gave me the gift of life here. I could have been born in Syria, or I could have been born one of those poor children in Mexico who is trying to escape violence and poverty. But instead, I was born here. The God question is really a me question. What is the worth of my life? If this is all there is, and life ends at death, then we are merely killing time until time kills us. Why then would anyone suffer for another person? Why would anyone display an act of courage? The ultimate question in faith is death, because death and belief in God are intrinsically linked together. I'm going to die, you're going to die. What does that mean? But we live in a culture that denies death. Up until 75 or 100 years ago, when someone died, they died in the midst of the family. The family washed the body, wrapped it in a shroud, and took it to be buried. Today, instead, we die in a convalescent home or a hospital, and someone else takes the body away. They wash it, they cosmeticize it, and we see it displayed in a strange parlor. Instead of putting death at the center of our lives, as has all of human history before us, we want to stay young and fit. Belief in God is an opinion. An opinion is only as valid as the evidence that substantiates it. Remember that reason starts with evidence that is certain and proceeds to conclusions that are probable. Let's start then with my intelligence. There is a fundamental philosophical premise that no effect can be greater than the sum of its causes. In other words, Nothing can exist that is greater than all the things that caused it to be. If that statue of Mary, for example, were suddenly to start to talk, you would know that someone put a speaker there because a marble statue can't talk. 
you can't get blood out of a stone. All right, if we start with my intelligence and no effect can be greater than the sum of its causes, if this is an accident, how did we get intelligence out of non-intelligence? It's impossible. Apply that same principle to the universe. What do we see when we look at this great universe? Objects rotating on their axes, and those objects rotating around others. In a great cosmic dance of attraction and repulsion, everywhere we look, everywhere, the laws of physics are the same. Now, I could understand getting variety out of an opportunity or an accident, but order, no. Every snowflake in Antarctica is exactly the same, and yet no two are. Every human being is modeled on the same basis, but your DNA has never existed in human history, and it will never exist again. Isn't that amazing if there's no prime mover? Take 10 cards, ace through 10. The chance of pulling the ace is one in 10. The chance of pulling the ace deuce is one in 100. But the chance of pulling all 10 in numerical order is one in 3.6 billion. And that is a relatively easy thing compared to all of this cosmic world in which we live and have our being. My intelligence is also the cause of undeniable hungers which no other species possess. We hunger for permanence. We hunger for justice. We hunger to understand why innocent people suffer. If there is no prime mover, why would we be the only species in all of creation to have hungers for which there is no food? Of course God exists, and we dare not do what the disciples did today and ever walk away from him. Amen.